Your Excellencies, uh, good afternoon. I have the displeasure of being the person who's standing between you and your lunch. So I will be very quick and brief. When I tackled my topic, um, the future is digital, it was just to invoke a sense of urgency amongst your excellencies around what we are facing uh, in the next 12 years, by 2030, and what we are facing by 2050. The residents of the cities you come from and their way of consuming data and consuming uh, the services that you supply them is changing, and it's changing rapidly. And it seems like most of the municipalities around Africa have forgotten that in the boardrooms today, and certainly in the next five to 10 years, we'll have 16 and 15 and 14 year olds uh, holding seats in those boards because the direction of technology has made them capable to speak at that level, to engage at that level. The only problem that we will have as the older citizens is understanding that their sense of dress and their sense of speech might not be what we are used to. But it is what it is. It is what the world that you are now living in. And it will be remiss of me to not talk about my origins as a Zulu boy from uh, KZN. Uh, the only reason why I say that is because uh, it's just a geographical marker of where I come from. But I am an African. And I'm interested in solving Africa's problems. I want my kids, like uh, Premier Makura said this morning, to be able to live in Lagos, which I had the opportunity to, to visit, to be able to contribute to the government of Yenagoa in uh, Bielsa State in, in Nigeria, where I stayed uh, for more than six months and to be able to go to Accra, to Kinshasa, everywhere else. And that can only happen if cities, which are at the cold face of the interaction between the citizenry and uh, local government, start working together in a collaborative effort to demolish the fictitious barriers that were created by our colonial masters, which have precipitated in xenophobia being one of the problems that you have in Africa. I grew up with cousins and nieces and nephews, and there was no distinction. If that person was male, that person was my brother. If that person was a female, that person was my sister. There is no distinction. If that person was my next door neighbor, <clears throat> the fact that they slept without having eaten should worry me. But the way that we have been socialized up to now, we have become more westernized than African. We still want to sleep and eat and carry our Louis Vuitton bags and, uh, and, and wear our red soles and go to these important functions. But the issues that we face around uh, communication with our citizens have remained the same. And the demands on us to contribute uh, to their life, uh, livelihood have actually increased. So I wouldn't, I've just been promoted to being a mayor uh, by my previous speaker, I am not that esteemed, so I, I wouldn't take that, um, that that accolade. But what I'm driving at is that four of the country's mega cities by 2030 or by 2050 will be from Africa: Gauteng, Lagos, Cairo, and Kinshasa. So this is where most of the growth is going to start coming from. Seventy percent of the of the urbanization will happen to cities that are secondary to the main cities of all the countries, which means there will be informal settlements in those, uh, in those areas. So this is just setting the context of what we're dealing with. So if that doesn't scare you enough, 15 of the cities in Africa will have populations of over 5 million predominantly living in informal settlements. Now, densification and urbanization is a reality. It's not going to go away. Whether we can wish it away or whatever we can do, it is our reality. 
Urbanization is going to be the primary context of life by 2050. And it has started now. But why would I say that? Why are we in the position that you are in? Inequalities that have been exacerbated by issues uh, such as infrastructure shortages. Neoliber neoliberal economic policy as a result of structural transformation uh, in the 1900s, 1990s and 2000s. The fact that um, the people sitting in this room have got, do not have the power that they're supposed to have to make the changes to policy that you should be making because you are the people who are facing citizens on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not uh, the president's house that will be burned if there is no water. It is not the, the, the provincial um, minister or the premier who, who's, uh, whose car will be burned if there's no electricity. It is the people in this room who are targeted by understandably angered citizens, but they do not understand the stresses that you are in. Now, when I say the future is digital, I came here carrying this cell phone. It controls what I do. This is going to be even more important going forward because it will be linked to an AI interface that will actually run my life. It will say, Mr. Manzo, this morning, the temperature is uh, 25 uh, degrees Celsius. I suggest that you wear uh, your blue suit and um, your car is waiting for you and your coffee is already uh, brewed. And your meetings are one, two, three, four, five. And this is not only going to be my domain as somebody who is relatively uh, well-educated. It will be uh, the privilege of everybody who has a cell phone. Statistics say that South Af uh, Africa has got 80% penetration of cell phones. It's going to reach 100%. Certainly by 2030, it will be 100%. What is it as a municipality or as a city mayor or as a local government official or a head of, of some department, what are you doing to use this powerful device to communicate to your citizens? Why is it that you let the likes of Facebook know more about the citizens that actually elected you than you do. This is going to be the future. It will even supersede, I would argue, radio as a means of disseminating information. Which means if you are in a municipality and you not track who comes into your offices and what they were looking for and how can you better improve the service next time, you are missing the point. And you are missing the point in the sense that you'll end up being intermediated in terms of the services that you provide. The young people you are raising today do not see the need to go to a bank physically. Soon enough, they only see the need to actually go to a government institution in an office to go and get a service. If they have solar power, if they have a, a grey water system in their, in their, in their property, if they have a water harvesting system and they've got a borehole, why would they need the city? Why would you maintain your relevance? This is the future we're going into. And in some instances, it looks like we are going into that, city, into that uh, situation very blindly. Now, cities have sort of try to address some of the issues that I, I relate to. In the uh, city of Joburg, they've got corridors of freedom to try and link up uh, certain areas uh, to get people to come to work. But the problem is that the reason why we've had to do that, we are backpedaling. We are trying to make what you already have work. The question I've always asked to all the companies that I, I, I consult to is, do you have in your team people who are interested about the future sustainability of the company that you, or the organization that you are leading? Do you have people stuck somewhere out there who are thinking about what you are thinking, who are thinking about what you, how you're going to be in the future? Because if you don't, disruption is going to happen and you're going to be blindsided by things that you didn't see coming. But the only reason why you didn't see it coming because it's because you, you were so concerned about fixing that 
burst pipe. You are so concerned about fixing that uh, pothole on the road. But what you are not realizing is that there's an underlying problem. Africa, we are, we are a continent of storytelling. What stories are we telling ourselves now? What stories will we be telling ourselves in 2050? Because unfortunately, you sitting here, your term of office ends in five years, ten years. But what legacy are you giving to the next generations? Remember there's a saying that says we are borrowing the, uh, the future from our, uh, from our children. So what history? What are you going to look at uh, in 2050, looking, looking back and say, this is what I achieved? Not in the five to ten years that you were in office, but what did you gift the city and the office that, that you, you held? That is the issue. Everybody talks about Industry 4.0, and there's going to be uh, deliberations about that uh, after lunch and, and in, the, in the coming days. That Industry 4.0 is not going to help anybody in South Africa, uh, in Africa, if we do not have a consideration around big data. It's not a complicated term. It just means that everything that we do has to be recorded and it has to be digitized because it will be used and consumed by the consumers now and the consumers of the future to determine where we go next. So this 4.0 is not just going to happen by itself. You have to start collecting data. I don't know how many times I've gone to municipalities in South Africa looking for services and came out. Nobody asked me what I did, how I felt about it, service, nothing. And the following time I'm going to go back there, I'm going to address the same problem. That is why we've got people in, 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 in Johannesburg. And for, fortunately, in, in Africa, we, we tend to overexpose ourselves and, and speak the truth, that you, you deal with the same issue of incorrect billing for two or three years, purely because nobody keeps record of what you did. They'll give you a reference number, which you'll have to start and relate your story again every time you go there. That can't be our future. It cannot be our future. So what do we need to actually solve these problems? We have to have a shared vision. Gone are the days where Department of Transport talks to Department of Transport and solve Department of Transport issues. Because the transport problem that you might be facing might be linked to something else within the city, within the local municipality that you need to resolve. So it's a case of you scratching your, 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 your foot to actually affect the, the itch on your, on your head. And if you, as long as you don't stay, see the linkages in the way that we, we run our municipalities, we are always going to be facing uh, fires and fighting fires and fighting with our citizens. And it should be a, speak to the second point about holistic governance and uh, the mayor being part of the ecosystem. The importance of your excellencies here in terms of delivering services to the populations that have um, elected you. It cannot be overstressed. So, as I conclude, so big data is not going to happen by itself. And the, the way we go about it is we collect data at every interaction within the local municipalities. Otherwise, we'll be blindsided. So, what is uh, Africa's biggest asset? It was said before, and I'll reiterate, it's our youth. We have 450 internet users in Africa which is 11% of the, of the, of the world uh, population of internet users. We've got 960 million mobile subscriptions in Africa. 80% penetration. Three billion people in Africa uh, uh, are going to be, or oh, 1.3 billion people are, are in Africa right now, and it's projected to grow to 2.4 billion by 2050. 56% of those will be living in urban areas. What are you doing? So, what can cities do? 
Firstly, increase investment in connectivity. Those Wi-Fi hotspots are not just there for, for Facebook and other frivolous activities. <laughs> the next way of actually getting employed will be people Googling you, people going on LinkedIn, people going on Facebook to find out what your social and digital profile is before they even call you for the first interviews. How are you enabling your youth to make sure that they take care of those, uh, partake in those activities? Collaborate to reduce data costs. This is an important issue. Cities must now start talking about how data is affecting productivity in the economy and start affecting the prices. Collect data at every interface. So I've said before, map all service delivery processes. Again, what I get at municipalities shouldn't be different on, depending on any day that I go to or, or the mood of the, the official that I find. It should be the same. There was a very funny incident that happened in Pulukwane where a certain Mr. Pinar was the only person who knew how to operate and open the water system. He went on leave, he went on retirement at the, at the end of, of November. On the 8th of December, the mayor gets a call that there is no water in Pulukwane. It was only after investigation of two hours they found out that it was actually Mr. Pinar who left with the information. It was not documented. So even though the dams are full, but the taps are dry. So how do you how do you do that without actually documenting every process to know who's doing what in your city so that you make sure that there's continuity? Otherwise you'll have those people banging on your door and trying to ban your car. So, as I conclude, the biggest blunder that Africa continues to make is to plan in political terms of office when every successful country plans in generations and centuries. Disruptions we see are predominantly caused by a lack of futures thinking and thinking that the status quo will remain. The private sector and the Indian municipalities know more about your electorate than you do. As Abraham Lincoln said, as I conclude, the best way to predict your future is to create it. What future are you creating for your city? Are you willing to build a legacy that will outlive your term of office? That is the question that I would like all of you to live with. Thank you.